Uh, I've listened to a number of uh, experts on school safety over the years, and I can tell you they don't always agree with each other. Uh, you know, some, sometimes there's differences of opinion on, on one might be the best way to go, but I, I think recently things have evolved that we feel pretty comfortable that, that we're covering the bases with what we're doing. Uh, one of the interesting facts is that you know, anytime there is a school shooting, there is you know a high level of interest and concern. But mass shootings uh, only occur only only twelve percent of mass shootings occur in schools. Twelve percent, forty percent occur in businesses. So you have a, you have a greater chance of you or your child being harmed uh, somewhere else than than you do in a school. But yet, because it is such an affront to us and, and it's such an intrusion on what we believe should be uh, a sanctuary for children, I think people tend to think of them uh, as more prolific than they are. But any of them, we don't want uh, and we don't want to see happen. So prevention is the number one thing that we're focused on, and uh, we put a number of things in place on that. But tonight, we're going to have uh, Deputy Montez explain to you some of the other things we've, we've recently done. We had him with us all summer, and he pulled uh, a lot of stuff together, and we're really grateful that he did. We feel very fortunate to have someone of his caliber in our district, and so I'd like uh, now just to turn over to you, turn this over to Deputy Jose Montez. Uh, it's very important uh, when it comes to the safety of all our students, staff, and visitors. Um, so we, we take this very seriously. And like Mr. Scalette said, there were a number of things that uh, I got an opportunity to uh, work on through this summer. Um, very thankful for the board uh, for giving me the opportunity to do that. Um, before we begin, I'd like to start by uh, talking a little bit uh, about myself. Uh, like Mr. Scalotta said, my name is Deputy Jose Montes. I've been with uh, the Erie County Sheriff's Office for about uh, five years now. Uh, this last year, uh, being part of the school district and the John McLean family. Um, very grateful for the opportunity that they've uh, had for me, uh, made for me here, uh, being a part. Um, a couple things, as I go through this material, um, I'd like to uh, explain and give some details of the changes that we made, the additions that we made throughout this uh, summer in efforts to improve and add upon the, uh, the safety and security measures that we have here in, uh, at the school district. Um, if you do have any questions, please uh, write them down, make a mental note, and we'll address all the questions at the end. Here's a little overview of the stuff that we'll be touching on today. Um, the safety and security, uh, the evolution of the changes that we've made uh, from where uh, it started when uh, I came into the picture and where we're, at, where we're at today, and a little bit of the uh, where, where we plan or where we would like to be in the future. Uh, I'll explain a little bit about the plan that we have with Navigate Prepared, which is one of the new programs. Uh, that we uh, put into place this summer. Um, the improvements that we've made as far as the, the structural, the, the building, and um, additions that we've made as far as technology. And the message, which is, I believe it's one of the most important things that Mr. Stiletto touched on briefly. Um, having that environment and kind of putting out that message that we want to create uh, a welcoming environment and as well as one that would be comfortable for students to be uh, okay with coming to myself, coming to administrators, staff members with any uh, problems or, or any situations that they might run into. Here is the evolution of the procedures and the practice that we have uh, that we would see throughout the country not just at John McLean, but everybody's used to, I'm sure even with you folks from, uh, from the drills and the practices that you would have uh, when you were in school, uh, 
who remembers the going along the, the side or the corners of a room and just kneeling down or sitting down and covering your head. Um, I think those, those days um, and statistics and information data that we have that we've been afforded the opportunity to look through uh, kind of shows that um, they didn't work out so well. Um, there, there were things that could have been done better or even just informing and empowering the students, empowering the staff members, really empowering the person that's going through some type of critical incident to make their own best informed decision. A couple of those things, uh, a couple of those places you see there, uh, Columbine, Virginia Tech, uh, Sandy Hook, up to Marjorie uh, Stoneman Douglas, which is the most recent one in Florida. Um, they, a lot of those kind of show and paint the picture uh, of what could have been done better, uh, just simply learning from the past. So if things were a little ugly, things were bad, uh, some horrific events that happened there, but at least we would be able to learn as much as we can from those situations, build on that, and try to improve ourselves as, as we are here in the district. Uh, the option-based response is the second side of that, which would be uh, completely different than your traditional lockdown. Like I said, it empowers a person going through some type of critical incident to make the best informed decision. So the way they can do that is by gathering the information, or as much information as they can, whether that's communicated through person-to-person uh, -person down the hallway, whether it's communicated through some type of mass text, or some type of a program like the new one that we just started, which is Navigate Prepared, informing them, giving, giving them as much information as possible. That way they can make the decision that's going to uh, help them through that critical incident or that potentially life-threatening situation that they might find themselves in. Uh, one of those would be the ALICE program. This began in 2001. They were one of the pioneers um, when it came to the option-based approach. Um, they, they began their program in 2001. It was started by a police officer uh, was sitting uh, at his dinner table for Christmas dinner. Uh, he heard the information come through that one of his fellow officers uh, had just been gunned down. Um, that got him thinking about this type of event uh, he was sitting across from his wife, and his wife was an administrator for a school district, and he asked, what would you do if something like this happened in your school district? Um, then she went on to explain the traditional lockdown, uh, what they would do, which would be uh, hunker down in a corner and close all the doors, shut the lights off, close the blinds. So that got him thinking, you know, how beneficial would that be how helpful would that be to get uh, one of our children out of a situation like that? Um, and he just started thinking, you know, it's, it's probably not the best way to go about things. So that's when he figured out that there was nothing else out there. He did his research, and nothing that was out there really convinced him that it would be helpful or beneficial for his own kids. So he took it upon himself and developed this new system which, like I said earlier, it's an option-based approach. They take all the information in, they process it, and say, okay, this is this decision is gonna be the one that's gonna get me out of this situation, and I'm going to be safe after that. And he then began the ALICE program. And we'll go a little bit into that here. ALICE is an acronym. Uh, this ALICE program, we've adopted it as a school district here. Um, like I said, it's an option-based approach. What it stands for is alert, lockdown, inform, counter, and evacuate. Uh, this does not have to be in the sequential order. It's simply a term that students, staff, or anybody uh, that takes this approach and adopts it into their system that they're currently in for them to remember that a little bit easier and be able to uh, make a decision if they do find themselves in a situation where they need to. Um, alert simply means um, I am going to let everybody else know that there's something going on. So like I said earlier, if it, it could be, uh, if we use this hallway as an example, 
a staff member or a student witnesses that something is going on, that student or that person simply yelling out down the hallway uh, what he sees or what is going on, that is a method of alerting. Uh, if they have the ability to uh, communicate this off through some type of text-based communication, they can do that as well. The PA system would be another method of alerting. And now, most recently, our Navigate Prepared Program affords us the opportunity with the click of a button to send out a mass notification to all the users, which all our staff members, administrators, and myself um, currently use this Navigate Prepared app, and we will be able to receive that alert of what is going on or what the potential problem may be uh, in our buildings. So lockdown, that brings us down to lockdown. Like I explained a little earlier, lockdown is a little different than our traditional lockdown here. So this lockdown, is, the term that Alice used is an enhanced lockdown. What that means is we're going to, yes, close and lock any doors if possible, but on top of that, we're going to attempt to barricade and block off that door. So by visibility or for, to prevent uh, anybody or the potential intruder or assailant to come through that doorway. So that is what they call an enhanced barricade to prevent from anybody coming in that doorway. The inform is simply a continuation of the alert process. So the alert process, like I said earlier, it sends out a mass notification or letting other people know the potential problem that they have uh, at hand. Information inform is simply a continuation of that process. So as the situation changes or as new information becomes available, uh, we want to update that way everybody else can make the best informed decision uh, in that critical incident. Countering. Countering, some of you might feel like it sounds a little rough. Um, I thought that initially as well, but this ALICE protocol, um, their version or the message that they're trying to get across for countering is simply stopping or interrupting the thought process of the person or the assailant. Uh, what I mean by that is anytime anyone makes any type of decision to start doing something, um, they have to do a few things. And that could come from um, our day-to-day -day basis. If I'm going to go open a door, I have to go observe that door to make that decision that I'm going to try to open that door. I orient myself in that direction. I make the conscious decision to grab the doorknob and I decide that I'm going to open it and act on it. The act is actually going through, turning the knob, and opening it. So everything, every day-to-day -day, uh, thing that we do involves this thought process. So what Alice and Counter want to do is interrupt that thought process. That way it buys us time, and by buying time we're saving lives, uh, potentially saving lives if any critical incident were to occur. The last one there is evacuate. That evacuate is self-explanatory. They're going to try to get out. Try to get out, um, no more follow the line of this is the route that you're supposed to take. Evacuating, you're going to try to get out uh, through any available door, uh, if necessary through a window if the situation dictates that, but you simply want to get out. And we'll cover that a little bit more afterwards in uh, our rally points as we touch on that. Navigate Prepared. So like I said, what Navigate Prepared does is it takes our emergency response protocols and takes them and from those big heavy binders that any type of uh, school district business or uh, even a place of worship would have as to how to respond to any type of critical incident, um, it takes all that information and puts them into digital format. That way all our staff members, our administrators have this available to be able to uh, refer to it um, or to make any decision if necessary. So it takes all those, puts them in an application, and everybody would have them available to them at, uh, at their fingertips. So definitely very beneficial, very helpful. Another thing that this does is it links our camera system into this Navigate Prepare. That way any first responder at 911 Center would have access to this. That way in the event of a critical incident, 
uh, first responders would have the uh, edge or have the benefit of being able to view our camera system. That way they would know what they're, what they're going into or what type of uh, things to expect. It also has floor plans with 360 uh, degree views, pictures of the layout of all our buildings. Again, that way uh, if they do have to respond and it is beneficial to them to uh, view these floor plans or view these pictures, uh, they have that available at their fingertips as well. Another one is our call list. Uh, in the event that we have to contact all our staff members, um, it has all our call lists there available. That way everything can be a smooth process and uh, we can get moving to, towards the direction that we need to get. Another feature that uh, Navigate Prepared has is affording us the opportunity to uh, add different documents, add different forms uh, that would help the administrators uh, maintain the safety and ma maintain uh, a secure environment here at the district. Uh, this is just an example of some of the protocols that were changed uh, this, uh, this summer to begin for this new school year. Uh, this for forms like this are also uh, input to not be prepared uh, to help us with that transition and help us get the, that information across. Uh, the safety check procedures, which is our basically our lockdown procedures and what we do when we have to lock down, uh, bomb threat protocol, and our critical incident, which would fall under the new Atlas protocol, are all there available uh, to uh, staff members. Now here, uh, I don't know if all of you got an opportunity to uh, get one of the papers at the table out front. Uh, this is this is uh, one of the ones that was available there. What this does is it's showing you the uh, new procedure that we implemented um, through this summer uh, for the reunification process. So in the event of some type of critical incident, um, and we have to evacuate and go to uh, a different site, uh, a different place where we would have uh, memorandums of understanding or agreement with other buildings or other businesses to uh, take our students there if this site or these buildings in the district are deemed unsafe and we would have to evacuate them to a different area. Um, this would be what we would use. Uh, there was no there was no process, formal process set in place. Um, this will only help us in those moments of chaos. Uh, so as you can imagine, if this would come into play with something uh, very, very big, very serious, some type of very critical incident um, where we would have to evacuate, a mass evacuation. So as you can imagine, that process would be very chaotic, uh, very difficult, um, and very lengthy as well. So um, I, I would just like you to be informed that if in the event, hopefully it never happens, but if, if something were to occur, it's a very lengthy process. We need to account for everyone. Uh, we need to get everyone to that off-site location safely, and then you will be notified of where that location is to be able to come and pick up your students. Um, it's very important that in situations like this, uh, you try to remain as calm as possible. I can only imagine how that uh, feeling would be uh, but it's very important that you allow the district, myself, and any first responders to uh, some time, a little bit of space to do the job to get everyone there safely before you report to attempt to pick up any student. Um, you can imagine all the phone lines being tied up uh, in an event like this, but um, we would get everybody there safely, then send out an all call or an alert to notify everyone of where that location would be. And and from there, we would give you this form here, fill out the form, we have to verify your, your ID uh, just so we know that we're actually giving the student to the person that you want. Uh, that's just for us, you can imagine just safety reasons to make sure that uh, the, the student is going to the appropriate uh, person or parent. Um, that's, that's why it's very important for you to please uh, verify your emergency contacts because if you cannot come pick up your, your student, uh, the only other person that would be able to pick up that student or your child would be anybody that's listed as your emergency contact. Um, so, show of hands, did anybody, did everybody here receive that uh, all call last night? Everybody received it? Okay, looks like everyone for the most part, so uh, that's good. If, you, if 
anybody did not, um, just make sure to update your information with the office. That way, uh, you will receive any further notification um, in, in the future. Okay, so some of the things that we're doing to further uh, move this process along, um, it's been a, a learning, uh, learning experience and we're all trying to get through this together through all these different changes. But what we're doing is tabletop exercises with the students, that would be in a classroom setting um, with their teacher. Uh, they will go through this and experience this with every period, with every teacher that way they're hearing it numerous times and they're uh, better informed this way. And we would be doing read and dialogue, which would be uh, scenario-based situations. Um, I myself would do that with any staff member in the future at a random time, just to kind of get people thinking about the possibilities and the options of things that could happen, how they would respond, and that's simply to better prepare everyone for any type of situation that might come up. Um, evacuation and rally points, uh, those are some of the things that were implemented through this summer as well. Uh, those rally points are simply uh, locations outside of the building in the event that we did have to evacuate. Uh, they're predetermined locations, that way staff and students know where they have the opportunity or what are some of their possible options to uh, evacuate to. Uh, that way we know that at these uh, strategically placed locations, uh, staff members can go be there, as well as myself, and I can relay this information to first responders. That way we can account for everyone using that new Navigate Prepared app, the respond feature to account for everyone. Lockdown. Again, just to reiterate, the lockdown is a little different now. It's a little different than what everybody uh, was used to in the past. Even the students that are currently going through this now or will be uh, practicing these things. Uh, it's going to be a little different. Um, so if you have the, the, the opportunity to uh, talk to your, your children about this and just inform them that it's um, a, a different situation, a different way of going about things, just to try to uh, keep them safe. Uh, one thing I do want to make uh, clear uh, by a show of hands, how many people do I have here for the elementary students? Okay, that's a good portion of you. So I, I, I want to let you know that this is going to be uh, age appropriate. Um, we don't want to uh, overstimulate or uh, scare, we don't want to raise any type of fear factor uh, with, with the students, with the little ones. Uh, we will definitely attempt to make it as age appropriate as possible. Um, as far as language, as far as the movement and things that have to be done. Um, we're not going to uh, make this a uh, bad experience for the children. It's simply another way of uh, responding to this stuff to, to better keep them safe. So for the little ones, the teachers will be making, obviously making those decisions, uh, making those movements. Um, but for the middle school, high school students, uh, they will be a little bit more involved. Um, just as far as uh, thinking, what should we do, uh, what are our options, um, how can we barricade, how can we close this door off, things like that. Again, it will not be anything that would be too uh, strenuous on them, but uh, we, we will have them a little bit more involved um, as far as the options that, they, that we would have for them. Uh, an intruder drill, uh, that will be one of the ones that would be added to our drills. Um, by law, now we were afforded as a district an opportunity to include uh, three safety drills amongst those drills that we already do. Um, so for those, we would, uh, in the future, attempt to include an intruder drill. Um, again, this will be a process that will have to be slow, uh, thought out. We're going to uh, crawl, walk, run. Um, we are not going to rush into this. Uh, the changes are made but as far as implementing it and uh, putting it out to the students, uh, we're going to do that. We're going to think very well about that and do it slow um, as to just to get them on board, get them to understand why we're doing the things we're doing. Uh, some of the security improvements uh, throughout this summer, again, uh, this is going to be my second year here, so since I've been here, um, that's all I can speak on now, but we've done 
uh, put some new cameras up, uh, more coverage, better coverage, uh, improve the, the, the type of cameras that are out there now. Um, some more coverage on the exterior uh, of the building, the parking lot, uh, as well as some of those blind spots that were here, just to uh, try to target some things that, that, that may be addressed here in the, in the buildings. Uh, one of those other improvements would be Alice. Uh, you see that there, it says blended model. Uh, that just uh, represents the, uh, the type of program that it is. What that means is uh, we have an e-learning side of it, which would be uh, tabletop exercises and tests for staff members to better educate us, ourselves, on this, uh, on, on this topic, on this option-based approach. And then we have the instructor-led training which would be uh, drills and scenarios and stuff like that that staff members would go through to better prepare them for any type of critical incident as well. Uh, Navigate Prepared, again, that's that app, that's that uh, uh, digital uh, response plan uh, that we adopted through the summer. And the standard reunification method, which were the cards that, uh, that we had up on the screen with, the, with your identification. Uh, again, there it's, there's that age-appropriate uh, section. I really want to stress that um, it's all the material that we're going to be presenting, all the drills, anything that we do directly with students is going to be age-appropriate. Uh, we have a series of videos that we'll be uh, launching and showing the students as to the options that they have uh, with any uh, type of critical incident or any type of drill. And those will definitely be age-appropriate. Uh, going from elementary, middle school, and high school. Uh, some of those reporting options that they have, uh, just to make you aware of them if you weren't already, uh, we have this uh, harassment email account, uh, harass.germanplane.org. Uh, if any of uh, your children feel like they're being harassed, bullied, cyberbullied, anything like that, that's uh, one of the things that they have available to them to report it. Um, I think with the, the type of response that I've gotten, uh, just in this year that I've been here has been great. Uh, students are feel comfortable, I believe, coming to me. Um, I've seen that they feel very comfortable going to administrators. I think that's thanks to the uh, type of environment that General McLean has already had and that message that they try to instill in students that uh, it's that family and, and they're open to help them and support them if they need it. So that, that's definitely great. Um, they know that, like I said, they come in person to staff members or myself to report anything, or even if they communicate that to you. And uh, again, in this past year, um, I've had quite a few parents contact me with uh, little things or questions, and that's great. So if you feel you have any questions, uh, if you feel you have anything that's concerning you or uh, a problem that your student may have, Feel free to reach out, contact me, and I'll do the best I can to help you out. And if I can't help, I'll definitely get somebody uh, that can help out. Uh, moving forward, like I said, more drills. And very important, that section there is debriefing. Uh, what I mean by that, anytime we do or will do in the future, any type of drill, uh, we will sit down together as with myself, administrators, uh, Mr. Scaletta, to see what we can build on, see what we can improve, see what we can better from where we were at. So not just doing the drills and going through the motions, but trying to grow from the situation that, uh, or the drill that we went through. Uh, again, it's, we're trying to do a proactive approach. Um, what I mean by that is we're trying to address these things before they become a problem, and if there is a potential for anything to come up, uh, we want to be ready and we want to be prepared to be able to address that situation. Enhanced communication, uh, what I mean by that, just having more avenues of how we communicate the event of a, of a critical incident, uh, myself as staff members, or getting that information and making that two-way uh, communication available for myself, students, and the administrators as well. Um, there at the bottom, as a parent, uh, having conversations with your child on the importance of listening to teachers and staff in emergencies. Um, like we pointed out, uh, this is uh, this is very uh, this is a very large group as far as the elementary levels. So it's very important for you to try to stress that, try to let them know 
that in the event something did occur, please listen to teachers. Like I said, they will be the ones making those decisions of what we have to do or where we would have to go. Uh, they're the ones that are on the ground, they're the ones that are in that situation. So listening and paying attention uh, would be would be key to be able to go through that, get through that uh, great moment. Okay, uh, this we talked about it a little bit already. Um, if something did happen, something did occur, your first instinct is going to be to rush to the school. And, and I get it, I understand it, but what, I, what I'm asking now is to wait, sit back, and wait to hear from us as to how to move forward and, and how to address uh, what we have going on. Um, if something is going on here, uh, we won't be able to do our job with mass crowds of uh, parents and cars coming into the district. Um, so I would ask that you please wait for further communication from the district before, uh, um, for that process to go as smooth as possible. Uh, we would need a little bit of time to uh, react and to try to address the situation as, as well as first responders that would be coming to assist. Uh, some of those ways that the, the communication and the information would go out to you would be through that alert now. Uh, so like I said, if your phone isn't, your phone number isn't updated with the district, uh, please make sure that you do that, it's very important. As well as if you're not already connected to uh, the district websites, uh, whether it's the main website or social media websites like Facebook, uh, it would be very beneficial for you to add those, that way we can uh, relay any, any information to those uh, sites. Uh, again, uh, updating your information is very important. Uh, do rely on official communication from the school or public safety officials, uh, that would be the information that would come through through Alert Now, any type of social media, or even the uh, news sources, local news sources as well. So that would be very beneficial to have. Uh, do listen for official information regarding reunification with your child. That simply means uh, that uh, point that I previously touched on as far as updating you with, with the location where we could potentially uh, evacuate to. So listen for that and tune into the local TV or radio stations for official schools or news alerts. Uh, one thing not to do is call or rush to your child's school. Again, I already touched on that a little bit, uh, but it would be very helpful if you could stand by and wait for further information and instruction uh, while we take care of the situation that we would be dealing with here at the district. Uh, the bottom one, I know it sounds a little tough as well, do not phone your child or uh, your child or school staff, but if there is, uh, depending on the type of incident that we may run into, and like I said earlier, hopefully we do not, but that could potentially cause some problems, or uh, that could be a little dangerous depending on the type of situation that we may be encountering, so we would ask that you hold off on trying to contact that student. I know that everybody has cell phones now, uh, but if you could just hold off on that, that would, that would be great. Um, that's, that's all the information that I have here now for you. I know it's a lot to take in. I know some of it may seem very difficult um, or a little tough to uh, take in, but uh, now I'd like to open it up for any questions that you may have with, it, with this information. If it's anything specific to uh, a student or any type of situation that your child may be going through, um, I will, I will wait here and we can talk afterwards, but if it's anything that has to do with the type of uh, uh, changes that we've made this summer, please, uh, I'd like to help you out now. Yes? Hi. Um, can you get a walk up there? Yeah, microphone going to you now. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, my students attend McCain Elementary and love it. It's awesome. Um, as a parent and a teacher in the neighboring district, I am concerned about the structural, the structure of the building, especially because any person with ill intent can enter the building upon being buzzed in. 
and then go either straight or left. And you just never know. Are there any considerations to changing the canal and entry structural entrance? Okay, um, yes, that's something that we've explored already. Um, one of the changes that we're waiting on now is our new camera systems. Uh, it's called, I believe, a bird's eye or bird's view. Uh, what that allows is uh, a straight picture of the person that is at the door. So what that would help us out with identifying the person as well as identifying with, uh, with some type of formal idea of who that is. That way we can you know, get more information as to why they're there, who they're there for, uh, stuff of that, of that nature to see if it's a legitimate reason for them to enter the building. Um, again, it would be, it's difficult to try to um, address every issue without making it um, completely locked down and um, almost like, for lack of a better term, prison-like. Um, but that would, be the, that would be the way that we're working on that right now. So that would be that, that camera. Okay, thanks. Uh, another question I have is, and I'm not familiar with this, are the classrooms in the canal elementary locked at all times? They're locked. Um, like doors are closed and locked at all times. Yes, that that's the uh, that's the the procedure that's in place now. So they're they're all closed. They're all locked. Um, it's a unique a unique situation because they can only lock and unlock from the outside. Um, but we've we've fixed that to where all all doors can be locked and they remain locked through. Uh, if class is in session, the only time they're open is if uh, in between for students to go in and out. Yeah, and the only reason I ask is because, like I said, I teach in my building the same way. Our our lock, our doors you have to be locked from outside. the outside. So unfortunately, it's just being the thought that we've all got used to it. Where kids, if they have to use restrooms, we have to let them in and back out, and we have to interrupt what's going on, and we just kind of got used to it. But our building is always technically in lockdown. Yep. So no one would ever have to go and lock their door and then come back in. So I just I've never known if that's the case in the game. Yes, or sir. in any of our buildings for that matter. Yeah, both uh, both elementaries are the same way. High school is one. Thank you. No, Um, how often will these drills occur? So, for example, the shooter drill or you know whatever drill. How often in a year's time do these drills occur? Well, like I said earlier, the the safety security ones um, we were afforded as a district by the state uh, to change out three of those. Um, they occur on a monthly basis, but there are other drills that have to be addressed, uh, like bus evacuation drills, uh, fire drills. So the state is allowing um, the districts to change those, three of those throughout the year into a safety or security drill. So it would at least be once a, once a month. Okay. Yes. So the state requires us to have a fire drill once a month. So we do have monthly drills. But like Jose said, we can switch them out. So we, at the high school, for example, we already planned out all of our drills. And in fact, we added a drill. Um, so we already had two um, in the month of September. So at least one per month. And, and like I said, to add on to that part, um, as far as a security or a safety one, uh, we're going to work our way uh, into a more involved, more intricate type of drill. Uh, the first ones are going to be simply sitting down with students throughout the first 10, 15 minutes of, of every period and going through the information, uh, showing a video that would be age appropriate for the students and letting them know of the, of the changes that are being made, the options that they have, um, depending, like I said, depending on the age group. Um, and, and then further, we'll build on that as we do more drills to uh, more like evacuating, uh, different ways to evacuate, uh, barricading if, if needed, stuff of that nature. But we're, we'll have to work our way to that. It's not going to be straight into the, the, the more intricate or more involved drill.
Thank you for being here. <laughs> um, I also want to thank the district for having, um, at least in both elementary buildings, the opportunities for childcare for students who are not school age yet. So thinking of growing and learning at Edinburgh Elementary and then at the Y has a program at Kino Elementary. So thinking about those components of those particular organizations or agencies that are part of any discussions and what might that look like for the children that go to those settings. Yes, a uh, very good point. Um, we have addressed this already. Um, we haven't involved them as far as uh, any uh, of the, the further changes yet. Uh, we are adding them to, like, for example, the Navigate Prepared. Uh, they will have access to this. And if, if you think about it, for those of you that aren't familiar with the setting, um, they're part of the building. Um, they're there. So we would like them to know if something is going on in that building. Um, they would get the alert, they would get the notification. Uh, they will get uh, ongoing communication if stuff is put out uh, that they can, again, make their best informed decision as to what to do, whether they have to uh, barricade or close down or evacuate, whatever the situation might be, um, they, they would be kept in the loop. I was just curious at how the staff and the buildings are being trained to go through these procedures. Yes, um, we had a district-wide training for this ALICE protocol, is that what you're referring to? Any, any of it. Okay, so there's quite a few changes that we've done so far through the summer. Um, so uh, part of that training was, uh, the most recent training was a familiarization and how to work and operate that Navigate Prepared app. Um, so they received training on that, how it works, uh, the, the features and the options that they have available to them through that app. And they had training on the ALICE protocol, which would be that option-based approach, um, showing them what their options are, um, basically empowering them, empowering the students to make the best informed decision if something does happen. So we went through, like I said, the e-learning part, which is uh, material online and a test online, as well as the instructor web training. Um, I'm, I am now a, a, an ALICE trainer. Uh, a, Few of the administrators are ALICE certified as well. We went through a, a training and certification for that um, to be able to present and cover the material to others. Uh, so they went through that with us and they um, have to successfully complete it and successfully complete the test online as well. Um, and again, this is ongoing. This is just the initial presentation of it. This is just uh, getting them familiar with all the changes, all the stuff that's going to be available to them now, this is going to be an ongoing thing. Um, we will have further drills, further testing, further training. Uh, this is going to be ongoing. So um, that, that will definitely be touched on as, as we move forward. I'm concerned about like after school activities, like the safety, because I always arrive anything and I have like sat and I've watched like doors that are unlocked or I've been left to open you know when there's nobody around that somebody that wanted her to get to have easy access I just wanted to bring that to your attention yeah no. I've always been afraid for her to stay after you know yeah and, and I can see that yeah. and, and I appreciate that information um, it's, it's something that we we try to address and we have to balance that uh, between, like I said earlier, from being uh, an open community setting opposed to a completely locked down and prison-like system. Uh, so it's, it's, it's kind of difficult uh, to balance in between that. Um, but as we see these situations come up, as we see a prop door, as we, we address it, we go, I go back to the source and go through our camera system, see who did it. Um, address it with that person, whether it was a staff member or even a student that you know, usually goes and props the door. Instead of going all the way around the building, uh, they prop the door to be able to come right back in where they, come, where they went out. And usually it's something like that, uh, the reason behind why this stuff happens. But I completely agree, it is a, it is a, a safety risk, it is a, a security risk. Um, but again, those are addressed case by case. Other than that, there's really no other uh, coverall or a better solution for that right now. So if anybody can help me out with that, I'm okay at taking suggestions.
right? Uh, well, thank you very much um, for being here. I uh, hope this was beneficial and informative for you. Um, if you do have any other questions, like I said, I will uh, hang around. I'll, I'll be here as long as you need me to be to be able to uh, help or uh, address any questions that you might have. And with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Mr. Scola. I just wanted to add a few things and then uh, ask for your help with the survey. Um, I watched a very interesting webinar about averted school shootings, and I thought, well, that makes a lot of sense. Certainly, we learned a lot from incidents that have occurred, but this organization, the National Police Foundation, wanted to find out from incidents that didn't happen that were going to happen. And uh, in line with every school safety expert I've heard and seen, the number one issue is school culture. The best prevent prevention against an incident is school culture. And that's kids feeling comfortable with the building, with the people in the building. Um, and th there's always this, this trade-off to play, and, and the after-school situation is a really good example of it. The more kids we have involved in after-school activities, the better the school culture is. Kids feel more invested in the school. So that's, that's a positive side of it. Making it hard for that to happen by keeping everything so locked down against that. So everything is, is, is a balance. Uh, same with inside-outside threats. You could spend a lot of money and buy a lot of equipment and make, and make your school like a prison to keep people from outside getting in. But this research has shown that, that both in the case of averted school shootings and shootings that actually happen, the vast majority were in the building to start with. They were students in the building. So you can spend a lot of time keeping people out, but it's, it's the people in. So that's that culture thing. The other very interesting statistic about this, the school shootings that were averted is that in a very high percentage of the, of the uh, incidents where they were did, where it didn't happen, it was other kids who reported it. It was other kids they told. Now, the shootings that actually happened, 98% of them were loans, they were alone. So the day after loan. But in the averted shootings, a high percentage, it wasn't going to be long. So one, one of them basically gave or, or said something to someone. So the important thing is to talk to your children about reporting what they hear, reporting things. You know, and a lot of times it's so easy for all of us, really, to just brush off, oh, you know, that they didn't mean that, or that wasn't, you know, what they meant, or that type of thing. But, but it's important that they, you know, the kids talk, especially the something that sounds suspicious, let someone know. You follow up. I, I, had a, I, got, a, I got an email last spring, and um, you know, the person was like, oh, I, I didn't know if I should say anything, and I heard this one, blah, blah, well, I, I contacted the building, they had already taken care of it, but, you know, it wasn't a problem, but it had been looked into, and I said to the parent, you did absolutely did the right thing. You know, it's better to be safe, and, and let us check it out, and then to act off on that. So, uh, when you go out, I, did you get a survey for the end? Okay, if you would fill out that survey for us, and Marissa is out in the lobby, and she has that reunification form for you if you would like to see that. So, again, thank you so much for coming tonight, and um, let's uh, just always get to communicate. Thank you.